Okay, this hour's parameter, though, focuses on UFOs over Canada, which is a book by John Robert Colombo. Now, John has been here to talk about this book. Today, though, we'll get to meet uh, one of the people who tells her story in the book, and her name is Betty Stewart. She's a lecturer, writer, UFOologist, and a former abductee. And I guess we should say, for the purposes of this interview, a woman who claims to have been abducted, because I'm sure there are a lot of people like me, I have to admit, who are a little skeptical about this. Betty, this is quite a story you tell in uh, John's book, I must say. One of the more interesting of the stories. You read it, I see. Mm -hmm. It's a little complicated, so if we can take people back in time a little bit and talk about this, this is not as easy as you remembering very clearly a day that you saw a flying saucer and they came out and took you and you were abducted. It's a little more complex than that. Can you just give us a brief recap of, of how your memories of this began? Well, the first incident was at the age of five. And uh, I didn't know at that time what it was. I thought it was just a recurring dream. And it was frightening. Um, but I didn't know why. I thought a train was coming for me. And, of course, uh, I couldn't relate that to flying saucers. There was, this was 1925. There was no, no such thing in those days. At least we didn't know about it. They still existed, but we were not aware. And uh, at the age of five, I just thought a train was coming for me. Then when I read Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders, in 1987, he had a case in there where a woman told about a silvery train coming for her. Now, mine was the old chuffing steam engine. Hers was a silvery train. I think they used this. It's what we call supplantive imagery. They used this to replace the drama and perhaps also the trauma of a UFO by giving us something that we can relate to. And that's why the train for its size and drama. I think this is it. All right, but this is not something you've consciously lived your life being aware of. This no, is, as you suggested, always, a, always a recent revelation to you. Uh, well, all right, you, you'd like to know the, the perhaps the latest abduction. Is that what you're referring to, Bill? No, I'm trying to get to how you, because you said this happened when you were five years old, but you didn't go through your life telling people no. you were abducted by an alien. We didn't it, know that. Though. This this came because of some hypnosis that you experienced, That, that is right? true. I, the first regressive hypnosis I ha underwent was in uh, January of 1986. And in that, we ascertained quite a few things. And, of course, what had really taken place when I was five, I had been abducted by three little... Uh, skinny-bodied, large-headed, wrap-around-eyed types. They were very, very kind. They knew I was a child, and they didn't do anything untoward. They didn't experiment with me. Uh, they did take my little nightie off, and one of them, I said, in the, in the regression, I said, he pinched me on the bottom. What he did was just give me a little squeeze. That was to, um, I imagine, to uh, examine the texture of my body. I started to cry uh, during the what was happening. I was floating on my stomach in, in the cabin of the craft, and uh, then on the I had a second regression done on that with Dr. David Gottlieb in Toronto, and we ascertained that at that point there were more things came out. And what were you looking for the first time you were regressed? I just wanted to have an overall picture of what had happened to me all through my life, and we had uh, several incidents covered, but we did it all in one session so that we didn't get in depth with it, you understand. So you still had this kind of nagging feeling that something had happened to you, and you wanted to know what it was. That's true. Now, when you came out of the hypnosis, was the memory then very clear to you? Yes, anything that came out in the hypnosis remained with me. Okay, so take me back to that first time when you were five years old. Uh, you remembered it throughout your life as a train coming to get you. Is your memory of that more clear now? Do you remember some kind of space vehicle coming for no, you? No, no, I don't. All I remember <clears throat> was what was brought out at the time of the regression. And I don't have any further revelations of what actually happened when I was five. I remember the train. That's it. And under regression, we did ascertain that it had been a craft. Hmm. Now, this has happened to you since then, much more recently. Oh, yes. The last abduction was in uh, uh, April 16th, 1988. And that was on board a mother craft. Now, with that one, I did have quite a bit of recall. And uh, I underwent regression for that on the, uh, in June of the same year with Dr. David Gottlieb. We wanted to ascertain just what had taken place. The craft had three levels on, on it. Uh, All right, you take me back now a little yes, bit on this. Yes. Uh, the close encounter began how? You were in bed, you were no, watching TV, no, you were doing what? No, the first thing, I was apparently, into all intents and purposes, asleep. Mm -hmm. or so I thought, these uh, come to you in a dream sequence, or so you think. And uh, my imagine that my etheric body was taken and my physical body was still reclining in bed. But in the dream, shall we call it this way, I... I was standing on a parapet of a tall structure of some kind. There were other people there. They were fo foggy, just nebulous, gray shapes, except for one person. And I said I would know her again if I saw her. I met her later on. She's a girl from Florida who came up here to contact me and to meet me. And I recognized her immediately. 
uh, and she was on board the craft. Now, on the lower level of the craft is where the, the scout craft came in to dock and then leave. And uh, my experience with this girl at the first, she said, oh, look, look, there it is, there it is, look. And I watched, and here was a, a traditional scout craft, if we call a flying saucer, banking and, and veering away from the mother craft. And uh, it was going to pick up another load, I guess. So that's the last I remember with her being with me. That's, that was finished. We went inside, and the structures on three levels, they had uh, habitat with uh, animals. There was a strong odor of overripe pineapple and overripe bananas. I remember that predominant odor. And there was a little uh, um, habitat with three. They looked like rhesus monkeys. And they were, there, wasn't any, there weren't any bars around them. There no glass. There wasn't any glass around them. And I couldn't understand what kept them in that position. Under regression, I found out each had an anklet, and he was secured to a little dead tree. There were three, three little dead trees, and each monkey had his own little tree. And in between the two end trees, there was a round glass pipe about two inches in diameter at the height of the trees, and it went up, and water coursed in and out of that, up and down and over. Don't ask me what for. Uh, Betty, I know you have a, an entire book's worth of information. That, oh, yes. I'm that sorry if I go into a lot of minutes detail. Of writing. You ask me, you're going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to try to skip through and just catch the highlights here if yes. we can. Mm -hmm. um, did you communicate with the aliens during the second encounter? No. Uh, they, they did their communicating with me. In other words, they extracted what they wanted to know from my mind and also implanted image uh, and, uh, and material with my mind, uh, material that I have since regurgitated uh, telepathically. Mm -hmm. It ca came in telepathically and it comes out the same way. Now, did you not at one time in your life believe that they had implanted something in your body? Oh, we have proof of that. We had it removed at York County Hospital. We videotaped the whole process and then went right straight down to the University of Toronto and had it examined. Right. And then what was this object? Well, they, of course, it contains uh, copper and silicone and all the things that are, are present in the human body, but in different proportions. Uh, before we had it removed, I went to my dentist and he x-rayed it for me. And prior to the, having that x-rayed, under regression, I saw what the pellet looked like. It was a little oval pellet with two little wires protruding. I na naturally assumed it was antenna, you know. But under the x-ray, we saw that the little oval pellet had, it was curved around. Those two little wires were curved around. They were merely used to adhere to the tissue when it was injected. And so it formed like a punctuation mark, a comma. And the reason it was able to show up in the x-ray, because they're not x-rayable, because they're organic. It came out that way because it had been there for 27 years, and a calcius buildup had formed around it, hmm. which, of course, shattered upon removal when the uh, surgeon removed right. it. Right. Have you since lost touch with this object? It was misplaced oh, along the no, way? Oh, I have it no. stored away. If anyone wants to get it, you're not going to. It's <laughs> put away very safely. I've had two subversive groups try to extract it from me. All right. Now, I have... Uh, let me ask some questions about what you think this what happened to you and why it happened to you because you believe you have a pretty good understanding of what's going on yes uh, so your theory why do aliens visit earth and why are they not making their presence known to the masses well they can't make themselves known to the masses we shoot first and ask questions later we're a very vicious breed and we're not at that stage we have our technology is wearing them because our spiritual development has not kept up with our technological development they're quite concerned we could blow ourselves to smithereens we're at that point now we have wars we have to close our doors against our neighbors at night isn't that a rather vicious planet would you say no they certainly cannot come on us they've been fired upon by various world powers we've set uh, scrambled aircraft up to attack for no good reason even though they themselves, even though the UFOs themselves were not showing any overt action or anything of a hostile nature. Now, how could a, a, a race with such incredible technology that they could travel from, from a galaxy beyond ours to visit us here on Earth be worried about our technology, which would seem almost pathetic by comparison? Well, they're not, they're not worried about us attacking them. It's not that. They are worried about what we are doing to ourselves because we're like little kitties given a can of gasoline and a match. We don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the, the aliens have been in contact with this planet since man's inception here? Absolutely. We are hybrids ourselves. That accounts for the missing link. It also accounts for the size of our brain capacity, of which we use very little. So you believe the aliens planted some of their seed here on Earth, if we could put it that way? That's true. And that's where the human race came yes, from? Yes, we are the degenerated remnants. Right. So they, they look upon us as children, it's your belief? Well, as far as our development is concerned, yes. But they must be very concerned about their rather you know, difficult children. Mm -hmm. Why do you suppose it is if we're visited as often uh, here on Earth as people claim we are, that we don't have any physical proof? We do have physical proof. That's another thing. Uh, many people say we don't have physical proof. We do. It's being kept in hidden from world powers and governments. If they were to let it out just holus bolus right now, the uh, stock markets would crash. 
religious people, groups uh, who don't have very deep thinking, would there be mass suicides by these people? Because they wouldn't, their b belief systems would be shattered. They no longer have a father figure guiding them, and because they have nothing within themselves to think with, they would be terrified. And then that's unfortunate. But uh, a bulk of our world's populace is made up of such. If they're so secretive, why would they allow you to come on shows like this and write books and go on television? Why would they let you do that? Oh, I'd hate to uh, resort to a little bit of conceit here. I think they contacted me at five. Now, I always say, what something they found in me, uh, or was I at one time existing on, say, another planet and another life? Whatever it was, I don't know which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Am I the result? and some total of their indoctrination, or did they choose me because of my propensities? Ultimately, what do you think is their goal for us? They want the, Well, ultimately, they want us to develop, really. And if they can help us along, they're going to. But there is a, um, uh, an intergalactic or cosmic uh, rule or law of non-interference. Man has free will, of course, but until he gets to the point where he knows how to use that free will and use it in a way that isn't harmful to himself and others, and they're certainly always going to be concerned about us. Mm. You're obviously very intelligent, very articulate. I wonder why someone like you would even tell this story, because I'm sure half of the people listening today are completely fascinated by what you say, and the other half thinks that you belong in an asylum somewhere, in a that you've lost that, your mind. Yeah, oh, that, would be, that would be the consensus of those who are not uh, wise to the facts. But I have absolutely no fear of ridicule. And at my age, I'll be 72 in January, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Now with my son, he says, Mother, you're not using the family name with this, I hope. I said, no, I'm using my maiden name. He wiped a little sweat off his brow. He has his own business, his corporation, and he doesn't want it to reflect back on him. And I am not allowed to speak of it in his home. Yeah. Does he believe then that you... He and his wife tell me, yes, they have an open mind. They certainly believe there, there is life on other planets. Uh, if you're listening in, dear son, he doesn't even know about this broadcast today. If, you, if he's listening in, he is also an abductee. I've never told him that. But I have the proof of it at home. It runs in families. My so if he's listening today, he's learning this for the first he's time. He's learning this for the first time, should he be listening. I doubt very much. He doesn't want to have anything to do with this. Right. Why would he have no memories of it? Just as anyone else does not. Your mind is blanked out. And if he has anything at all that he feels might possibly be, he has put it on the back burner. All right. Let's open up the phone lines. 870-9152-1800-668-7625. one 668 rock if you'd like to ask Betty Stewart a question about the story you've just heard, and it is certainly a remarkable story, um, or you maybe have a story of your own. Can't imagine you could have one that would match this. 870-9152-1800-668-7625. We'll open up our U.S. line as well. We have to go far and wide to match this story, so we'll go down to the States. 1-800-668-ROCK. It's a toll-free call. You're listening to Barometer. This is Q107. My guest, Betty Stewart. We should start. Ooh. Bill Carroll here with Betty Stewart. And uh, she is one of the many people who've told their story about UFO encounters and abductions to John Robert Colombo in his book, UFOs Over Canada. John's been on the show. We wanted a chance to meet Betty firsthand because her story is pretty remarkable, to say the least. And we'll go to the phone lines, trying very hard to keep an open mind today. I think so far I've done a pretty good job. You have. Richard, go ahead. You're Please on the air. So. Hi, hi, Betty. Yes. This is, this is incredible stuff. I, I'm really fascinated by this. I wanted to ask, uh, the implant. Yes. Uh, you mentioned, I was wondering why it was implanted. Was there a reason? That, that, the one that was removed was a locator, just the way you would tag a deer in the forest. That's all it was for. Okay. Just so they could, you know, zone in on me anytime they wished to. I that, also that, ask one not, more question. Yes. Um, this isn't cynical at all, but, um, what do they, what do they think about, um, our, our capacity for imagination? Well, I don't know that I've ever encountered any discussions on that. I imagine our creativity is also in relation to our intellect and our spiritual development. Betty, I'm not quite sure I understand the need to keep track of someone, uh, the need to continually abduct humans. I mean, we're, we're supposedly talking about a race mm -hmm. that has this yeah. marvelous technology far beyond our wildest yes. dreams. You know. All right, so they, they select a specimen myself in particular. They want to keep track of that specimen, just as if you were a scientist, and uh, not in my case particularly, but the ones that they have done experimentations with, they want to keep tra track of them. And they, they collect flora and fauna, and they keep abducting, re-abducting the same people over and over to see how they are doing and how they are progressing. And as for myself, they keep giving me more information. Why do they need to give you information? So that I can do what I'm doing right now. Right, but you said earlier they don't want us to know about them. 
No, no, I did not say that. Uh, perhaps that's a misunderstanding. Definitely. They, they do want us to know. But the point is, I think you're thinking of the mass landing. No, they can't do that. But they do want us to know, and it's a gradual, gradual re revealing of their presence. We're not right, quite this, ready for it. Right. Well, this would seem like a very subtle way to let us know, because I would think most of the population doesn't believe your story. Oh, I imagine a lot of them do not. That's entirely their privilege. And when I, when I hold symposiums, I get the odd heckler, and I tell them they're entitled to their opinion. I only hope that they'll hold an open mind, because eventually they're going to hear, and they're going to say, Ye gods, 15, 20 years ago, if only I'd listened to Betty Stewart. Dan, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Well, I don't have so much uh, a question as a comment in that um, I think it's really absurd that so many people don't believe in other intelligent life forms, considering in, in our galaxy alone we've got millions and billions of suns, who, who knows how many, with uh, habitable planets revolving that, them. That's Dan, is it? Yeah. Yeah, Dan. Well, of course, this is the way it is with hu human nature, but mostly those who will deny it's through fear actually and fear is very closely related to hate and that's why we have wars and when you have a civilization that is divided in thought this way you have a very bad civilization we can't help it that's the way we are now those who disagree with what i say i'm not saying they're, they are the world's enemies i'm just saying that they are unfortunate not enough not to be privileged to have a little more information if they keep their minds open perhaps they'll learn a little bit and not allow their religious beliefs to uh, spill over. Uh, I know I did have one caller on another show last week, and she uh, prefaced her whole opening by saying, I don't believe in UFOs, I believe in God, as much as to say that you cannot believe in both at the same instance. Which was unfortunate, because I certainly believe in the supreme being and supreme essence, of which we all are part. It's not a man sitting in a white nightshirt up on a throne in, in a so-called heaven. Uh, those who adhere to that are very, very, very primordial in their thinking. And I think most scientists seem to agree now that there is likely to be life somewhere else in the universe that it's oh, yes. very possible especially since the discovery of that new planet we all heard about a couple yeah. months ago but they still insist that the kinds of distances we're talking about traveling would take millions of years even for the most advanced technology. Do you have an explanation for Absolutely, that? Absolutely, because they are thinking of our, di our dimension, and they're thinking in relation to our dimension. These, all of these beings are, have the capability of becoming interdimensional. We did at one time, too, when we were a hybrid way back when. But we've lost that ability. In order to reach, they come from three sources. They come from uh, our own future. They come from our own reality, but at a distance. And they also come from parallel universes. Now, in order to traverse uh, from another distance in our own plane, they have to become interdimensional. And they have to, it always amused me years ago when they say, oh, they must travel as fast as the speed of light. They have to exceed it, or they can't get from point A to point B. They must exceed the speed of light, and it is achieved. Let's go to Hamilton. Jeff, what do you think of all this? I think it's uh, absolutely true. First of all, um, I myself have seen something. Good. And uh, I have seen a craft. Um, not too many people believe me. In fact, no one believes me. Okay, what sort of craft did you see, and when did this happen? Okay, this happened, um, I'm 27 now. I saw it when I was 10 years old. We were, um, we, I, live out of, I used to live out of town in the country, and we were heading in towards the city. We had to pick up somebody and uh, drive back. And we're driving along the highway, and I looked over to the right. I was just looking in towards the woods, and I saw something hovering over a building. Now, the building was, like, out of town, so there were no other lights around it. And there was a craft hovering above the building, uh, maybe 100 feet up, and it was about... Uh, 100 feet in diameter, completely round, with orange lights around it. Now, everybody must be thinking, oh yeah, what movie did you see this out of? Yes. Well, I've, I almost went into a fit trying to get my mother to pull over so we could see it, but it was a very busy highway when we couldn't stop. But I wasn't really completely assured that it was something until I saw it about uh, two years later in a magazine or in a book mm -hmm. on UFOs. I saw that actual craft. You saw the very way I saw it. Okay, okay let, let me ask a couple of questions, Jeff, because yeah. uh, you, I believe you, you probably saw something. What exactly it is, I think, is open to debate. But since Betty claims to have, a, have rendezvous with, with UFOs, maybe she can explain a couple of questions that keep coming to mind. First of all, if these are beings who don't want to be seen, why did Jeff see them in the first place? Obviously, uh, with their technology... They don't have to be seen if they don't want to be. They don't necessarily not want to be seen. They reveal themselves to certain people. There have been instances where several people in a group will have seen a very obvious UFO that the others should have seen but did not see. They were not ready yet, so therefore they were not pretty. Before Jeff, before you leave, I'm going to ask a favor of you. Or actually, it's for yourself. I would like you to look up John Robert Colombo's name and phone number 
in the telephone book and get in touch with him. Okay. You have a very, very valid case, and I'm sure Mr. Colombo would like to discuss it with you. Another question that comes to mind is why do we not have, Jeff said he saw a photograph in, in a book, and we've all seen the photographs, but we don't have a definitive photograph on a planet where there are billions of cameras, mm -hmm. on a planet where mo a lot of people now have videotape recorders. Why don't we ha not have that piece of documented evidence? We do have it, but it's refuted by those in the power to refute, and therefore it's held back. There's plenty of documentation. I have. But the, come on, let's say, have you ever seen a photograph that you looked at and said, that is not of this earth. I mean, you, you get a blurred light. You get sort of a glimpse of some metal. You get a lot of things, but you never get something definitive. And that seems very, very I strange to me. Uh, well, I'm going to differ with you there, Bill. There are photographs that have been validated, and they are quite definitive. Mind you, they're rare because they're, usually they're taken, oh, all of a sudden, you don't have time to focus your camera. You grab your camera quickly, and uh, that's why we don't have, if someone was going to sit there and wait for a UFO, they'd be all set up, and the UFO is not going to oblige you that way. They don't work that way. So usually they're done in a hurry and in a helter-skelter way, but occasionally we do get a sharp one. Jeffy, go ahead. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. Um, a question and a comment, if I could. Sure. Uh, I'd hate to be the voice of reason here, but a lot of your listeners seem to be going for this. Uh, the question first, um, why, if, if, if your guest canisters, maybe some of your subsequent callers could, why do they always uh, seem to be sh sh shrouded in all these lights, these uh, extravagant lights, uh, whereas craft on this planet, the only reason they use lights are for safety purposes, so people can see them. Yeah, well, that's sort of the question I asked a yeah. minute ago. But yes. it's, it's well, that, that, in other words, they intend for us to see them. When they reveal themselves, it's not by accident. They intend us to do so. As I said, it's a gra gradual indoctrinization, a gradual realization that they are here. You buy that, Jeffy? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, okay, Bill. Um, I don't really buy it, but uh, fair enough. Uh, the comment I wanted to make, Bill, is uh, uh, this is sort of a little bit insulting, I think, to a lot of your, uh, your listeners to, to have this on. Um, I can understand, you know, you can't have a, you know, a topic every day that's of interest to everybody, but uh, I think some of your listeners would be insulted by this. Well, are you was, among them, Jeffy? Uh, to be quite honest, I enjoy the show, Bill, and, and this, the first, my first instinct was, is this has got to be a joke. I thought, this is April Fool or something. I had to check the calendar twice. And, <laughs> yet, <laughs> and yet, you picked up the phone and you had to ask a question, right? Yeah. There's first something, time you've been on the air. <laughs> there's something there behind your, your questionings, there must be. And there's a little inkling, a little nagging that's telling you to do this. Anyway, keep an open mind. You have a right to your opinion, my dear. All right, Jeffy hates today's show, but he just had to get on the phone and call. Yeah. Craig, go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah, I want to ask Betty if she's ever heard of uh, the book of Urantia. No, I have not. Okay, because you commented earlier that we were um, uh, kind of placed here by the aliens. Yes. And that the book of Urantia is almost like a Bible. It's something like 5,000 pages long. Yes. Where is it published and from what source? Uh, the source is the really bizarre part. Apparently, some psychic somewhere in the world in... 1950-something or 30-something. Through channeling? S pardon me? Was this done through channeling? Uh, sort of, I guess, yeah. The, the guy just sat down and started writing, and he wrote for nine hours straight. And Poor darling. And he stopped. Another guy started talking somewhere else, and all the information was correlated and placed in this book. Yes. And uh, it explains how Earth was started by aliens. A, and that it's okay, but can, can I, I don't want to yes. get off on this tangent. Yes. Let me ask you, Craig, what do you think of Betty's story? I can't help but believe it. Um, I think it's a little conceited to think that we're the only beings um, in the in the universe, like seeing how large it is, you know, and to think that a little tiny Earth is all there is. I, I believe Betty all the way. Thank you very much, Craig, for right, support. Craig. Thanks for calling. 870-9152. Let's take another long-distance call, actually. We'll go to Kitchener. Raddick, hi. What do you want to say today? Yeah. Uh, how do you, how, how would I be able to get in t contact with them? You can't do it. They, if you, they want to get in contact with you, they will do so. I've had many friends. I have one elderly friend. He, he said, the next time they contact you, ask, ask them if I can take them. You can come. I want to go with you. I want to go with you. I said, it doesn't work that way, Arthur. I said, I'm sorry. It can't be done. <laughs> I said, I don't even know when I'm going to have contact. So and you believe you'll have contact again at some point? Are you speaking of me? Yeah. Oh, and, and undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. All right. Let's uh, take one final call here, and then we'll wrap things up. Rick, go ahead. You're on the air. Okay, Rick decided to hang up. Well, let's try one on the fly here. If we uh, put you on the air, make sure your radio's turned off. Who's on with us? Hello? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're on the air now. What's your name? Uh, uh, my name is Jerry. Okay, Jerry, just crank that radio down and ask your question. Uh, hello? Yeah, is it a comment you want to make? Yeah, I don't have a question. I just had, had an incident that happened to me. Okay. Good. Um, right. I spotted three of them myself. 
and uh, they were flying by. It was broad daylight, and that was about it. It was just three saucers. I was at Bayview and Highway 7, and there was a Cessna airplane flying by at the same time. Uh, what is your name, my dear? Jerry. Jerry. Uh, would you also, as I have requested of another listener, look John Robert Colombo's phone number up in the Toronto phone book mm -hmm. for your own sake, and he can fill you in on something. If you would call him, it would be to your advantage to do so. Okay, great. All right, thanks for calling. Thanks to everybody who called in today. And let me point out to Jeffy that uh, this is hardly the first radio show that, that Betty has been on, and she's been on... Uh, the, the topic, obviously, has been discussed on CBC and on uh, television. Ma major television networks. Uh, I think we have to be open-minded enough to at least consider the possibility, and there are stories to be told. Frankly, Betty, I don't think you've convinced me today, but you've certainly convinced some of our listeners. And Bill, we... do I look like a kooky old lady in tennis shoes? Well, you're not wearing tennis shoes. <laughs> That, that leaves... <laughs> but we let people judge for themselves. Mm -hmm. Your story is told in John Robert Colombo's book, UFOs Over Canada, Personal Accounts of Sightings and Close Encounters. And I also know that you're working on your own book and uh, you're doing a seminar coming up soon as well. Uh, yes, uh, John Robert Colombo and I are doing a, a tandem lecture or symposium at Newmarket Library on the 13th of November at 7.30 p.m. And anyone who lives in the area, if you wish to come, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. If you couldn't get on the air today, come there and we'll do our best to help you. All right. Thank you, Betty, for coming in.